Hello and good morning and welcome to the first 2024 Austin Sister Cities Business Protocol Training. Today's training is focused on doing business with Austin and is in partnership with Austin Community College and the Central Texas Learning Festival. Today's training is hosted by Dr. Kevin Clark from Austin Community College. Dr. Clark has extensive experience in business protocol and international exchange. Dr. Clark, please take it from here. Well, thank you, Aditi, and welcome everyone. Uh, what a great, beautiful day to talk about uh, business protocol in Austin, in Texas, in the South, and in the US. Right here as we begin spring break. Uh, so welcome again. Uh, let's take it away and let's take a look at what we're gonna talk about is business protocol for those visiting Austin. Uh, of course, a lot of our protocol is for our own partners who are going abroad, um, but we have four dimensions of this actually. Um, of course, what it is to be American, the US, uh, what sometimes gets left out about being in the region of the South, specifically to the state of Texas, and then of course the city of Austin. And we're gonna particularly look at some fun facts for some of these. Um, some culture and stereotypes to see, you know, some kind of play out, not very, they're not very true. Some are true and there's partial truth. Um, and our four main areas to look at, as we do with all the protocol training, are greetings, meetings, dining, and refining. And we'll just take a brief look at Austin today, too, which, of course, if you're joining us here <clears throat> and you are from Texas or the U.S. or, of course, Austin, you may recognize some, you may not recognize, but it is good for anyone coming to visit here. So let's take it away. Um, uh, so there's our beautiful skyline on a beautiful day like this. Um, let's talk about some of our sort of uh, our uh, stereotypes here. Um, these very three things I saw in an episode of Let's Make a Deal, they've repeatedly had trips to Austin, <clears throat> which really puts us on a map. And they always use the same three things in three pictures is uh, live music, uh, fields of blue bonnets and barbecue. Um, so that is on the minds of a lot of people right here in the US. And then of course, in other countries as well as they visit our fine state. Um, <clears throat> and of course there's more to Austin than that. Uh, some fun facts that uh, I've had visitors come to actually ask about it. They knew about this is uh, almost, we're almost there next month from April to October at dusk, 1.5 million bats fly out from under the Congress Street Bridge and they consume as much as 30,000 pounds of insects such as mosquitoes. So this has become quite sort of a tourist event and even for Austinites themselves to see this. It was accidental, the bridge was built and um, it turns out it was a perfect uh, ground for, for these bats. Another one that also we'll talk when we get into stereotypes and take a look at is starting um, a little over 20 years ago, um, a bill was passed to make it legal in Texas for most anyone uh, 21 and over to carry a handgun in a holster without a permit, both openly and concealed. Before that, concealed carry was the, the lay of the land. Now it's open and concealed. Um, but that also means that your chances of being a victim of a violent crime in Austin is one in 200. And another little fun fact is you may know something about the Gigafactory uh, made by Tesla. It sits on 2,000 acres of land and um, it's about the size of 15 city blocks. This makes it the second biggest building in volume in the world. In fact, I used to drive past there when they were building it, I had no idea what it was, but I had never seen such a big building and that would explain why. And you can see on the roof there in Tesla's font, it actually spells out Texas. Okay, so let's take a look, uh, have a little overview of the population here. Um, the US's population is 334 million, which makes us third in the world after uh, China and India. Uh, the South itself, which is about 17 states, has 130 million. And of the four main regions, we are that ranks first. Uh, Texas has 31 million, which puts us second after California, and an area puts us second after Alaska. And the population of Austin is just under 1 million, 
The metro area is about double that at 1.8 million. Um, Austin then is the fourth biggest in the state. And now we just uh, went past San Jose, California. We're now 10th biggest city in the country. So let's take a look at the US population a little more. Again, the rank goes China, India, and the US. Um, this is set to change. India will soon become the most populous country in the world with China second, and then the US still in third place there. We can also take a look at the ethnicity of the US. Often in the news, we hear stories about major uh, ethnic groups. But if you look at the national origins of, of immigrants to the US, um, in, in fact, uh, the statistics here show there are people from, um, uh, just from, um, in one year, 1.5 million immigrants from 200 countries. I think the UN list something like, depending on where it's listed, between 192 and 195 countries. But nonetheless, if you look at the top seven here, it may be surprising because we don't often think that for, for 150 years or more, the majority ethnic population of the U.S. is actually German. That's the red on the map there um, uh, across the country. The second is, is undifferentiated, but from Africa, African-American is in the, uh, the blue, particularly in the South. Um, third is Irish. Uh, and that's in the green there. Uh, fourth is Mexican, that is in the orange. And fifth is English, which is in the purple, which is largely New England and some in the um, mountain states there. Um, so you'll see and then followed by Italian, Polish. Now it's kind of interesting because we don't often think when we term, use the, people often use the term Anglo to mean an English speaker, but it doesn't necessarily mean someone of English descent because in fact, very few people actually uh, uh, speak German. Uh, um, people have learned English. In fact, if you go back 150 years ago, the majority language of San Antonio, Texas, was actually German because of a big outflow in the 1860s. So the ethnicity doesn't um, really spell out actually modern day, of course, ethnicities, but those are the top seven. Now, if you look at the South itself, the way it's usually divided here uh, we often think of the Mason-Dixon line. That's the line between Maryland and Pennsylvania during the Civil War. That's the dividing line at the top. And then the dividing line at the bottom is our own state here of Texas. Uh, that puts the South as the most populous region at 130 million and followed by far by the West, Midwest and Northeast. Um, it also means the South has technically three time zones because we get El Paso, at the far western extreme, that is in the mountain time zone. We're in central, and of course, the eastern states are in the eastern time zone. Um, uh, sometimes people will use the term south, but actually in census and other things, this is used because uh, we need to keep up with the flow, the ebb and flow of people and where they are. So there we are in the south. Now, the South is also the fastest growing. It doesn't seem like much at one about 1%, but if you'll see here just from 2023, the South is growing faster uh, than the sort of second and third place are almost the same in the Midwest and West and the Northeast, which is shrinking. And in fact, um, uh, you can watch these trends. The West and South do tend to be gaining the most population and areas of the Midwest are actually shrinking. Just a side fact there, for example, right now Chicago is the third biggest city and Houston is the fourth, but within 20 years, Houston will be the third biggest and Chicago will fall back to fourth. So it is quite a bit of, uh, of um, change in, in um, populations. Right here in Texas, 200,000 Californians a year move to Texas. That's quite a bit, so in 10 years, that's 2 million people. Um, now, if we want to take a little bit, just step back for a second to take a, a little look here at some of the theoretical reasons that Americans are the way they are, is to look at Hofstede's cultural dimension. So in brief, Gerda Hofstede was a Dutch researcher. He worked for IBM 50 years ago, and he realized that 
the places that IBM was around the world had to operate a little differently because of the cultures they were in. Now, of course, that means not one culture doesn't outweigh another, they're just simply different. But he came up with six scales uh, to rank each of the roughly 192 countries um, to see how they operate. Now, I have here just four listed with the US as one. One is France, and we've got a little of Europe, we've got Japan, we've got Asia, Mexico, we've got Latin America. And you'll see here in the circled areas in green are where the US uh, places itself amongst the others. You'll notice that in the first uh, area there, the US is really low at 40, that's power distance. This is a belief in equality with not much regard for authority. Uh, we tend to call each other by first names. We don't see a lot of power difference. In the second individualism, this is a particularly well-noted one and well-studied because the US always ranks first in individualism around the world. It has the highest score, which means we believe in individual achievement, like in the American dream. Uh, this means do it on your own. You deserve the credit. Of course, you deserve the blame as well, rather than in a team. And the last one is in masculinity. The scale is masculinity and femininity, which is not about really gender. It is about uh, a gendered way of seeing um, how social systems work. For example, Scandinavia tends to be very feminine because they have a deep sense of, uh, for example, socialized medicine. Um, uh, but the U.S. does not. So we... We're not all the way at the top. We're also not at the bottom here. Um, we're a little more masculine than, say, France, but we do rank below uh, Mexico and Japan. So this says a lot about who we are if you just look at these. We see ourselves as equal. Everyone has a right to succeed. That's it, the American dream as an individual. And uh, part of doing things on your own is not expecting um, help from um, societal structures. Now, I believe um, part of our culture in the way we interact, I call it Conestoga wagon friendliness. It's my own term here. Um, um, it's a combination of um, individualism and equality that's led to this culture of friendliness. Uh, if you think about it in the 19th century, as Americans, both new, newly arrived on the East Coast or from the East Coast, started heading west, they had everything in their Conestoga wagon. So they sat at the, the head of the family, the man sat in the front, he had his wife, his children, he had some pigs in the back, he had grain, he had some dry goods, but he always had a gun down below where you couldn't see it. And the best thing to do was, instead of encountering other people in sort of a lawless land, was to wave hello. Now that's kind of a little bit shortening it up a little, but the best way was to start with being nice. And I think this is a lot of where our kind of culture comes from. We were not, most of us are not from areas that are chocolate block with people. Uh, that is why, for example, say somewhere like the biggest city in the world, like Tokyo, would be very different in this regard. Um, we say hello to everyone, even people we don't know. And in fact, I find that the distinction between the word friend and friendly is extremely important. Um, I've had visitors from other places, my friend from Helsinki, who says, why are people trying to be a friend? I'm like, no, they're being friendly. They're not a friend. And those are different things. Um, the adjective and the noun are quite, quite different. I think it's because we are trying to flow past each other, not unlike the poor frightened fellow in the front of his Conestoga wagon, wagon holding his gun below, out of view and trying to be nice. Um, so this combination of individualism and equality has led to a culture of friendliness. Um, we even have something called bus rider syndrome, which today might be airplane syndrome or anything else. You're meeting in public with other people you don't know. And this is where we reveal intimate details to strangers. Uh, for example, those seated next to us on a bus or an airplane on a longer ride. In other words, we'll tell complete stranger things about us that we won't tell people that we know just a little bit. Um, and in fact, Americans in informal situations may ask personal questions and psychologize, if we can use that as a verb, their conversational partners. Well, it sounds like you're having problems with blank. 
we do this quite a lot. Um, so let's just take a look here. Here's an example of, uh, of an immigrant to the U.S. and how much she enjoys the aspect of saying hello to people that she doesn't know. First of all, Americans are really loud at restaurants. I can barely hear my friends speak. Now, something really weird that happens in smaller towns, people say hi to each other even if they don't know each other, which is, by the way, amazing. I enjoy saying hi to people that I don't know just because I see them. So there we go. Uh, now, this is something we take, we often take for granted, uh, but it is quite a distinction for people who aren't from the U.S. generally, whether Asian, um, less so Latin American, and certainly European. Um, so again, there's this sort of interpersonal intervention that we sort of feel like we have a right to with people around us because we're friendly. We're trying to help them. We psychologize them. So I found this episode of Square Eye in Japan, where the guys go and try to help people have uh, who, are, who are not doing so well, you know, fix up their their flats, their apartments, uh, cook better, but also interact better. Now, this is particularly interesting because in Japan, this is not a way that people do things. They don't talk to strangers. They don't talk to people they don't know. In fact, if you've been to the subway in uh, Tokyo or Kyoto, you know it's actually quite quiet. It's a little rude to speak loudly. But I want you to notice here in this clip of what an American is trying to impose upon um, his Japanese hosts here in trying to get them to talk in a way that fits just right in America, but does not fit so well in Asia or in particular here in Japan. This is the part that's really most important for you two. What you two are experiencing, the fear of communicating with your partner is something that many people around the world go through. So I need you two to turn to each other. And I want you two to hold hands. All right, you first. What is the fear that you have? Do you love him? What are you thinking? してます。でも私と結婚してうん後悔してないかなとは心配です。ずっと料理もしないし家事も苦手だし、なんかちゃんと奥さんやれてなくて申し訳ないな<笑> <私も苦手だし>、<笑>正直に Feels good. <laughs> I see you getting emotional. Come here. <laughs> so this might be the most American sort of interpersonal um, trait we have is this instant intervention, you solve a case in three minutes, and maybe it's uh, it takes something more, or maybe the idea of the psychology is not really part of the culture as here. Um, on the other hand, of course, he was invited, uh, but this is an extremely American thing. And if you travel, you know this. When you try to figure out, you know, you'll ask somebody a question like, what was going on there? They'll look at you like you've assaulted them because um, that is an American trait 
that doesn't tend to uh, work very well in other cultures. Now, let's talk about where this comes from in history just a little bit. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that the word Texas is derived from the Caddo word um, here, uh, which is Taisha, which means friend. The Caddo Indians were, or Amarins, were the first people um, in Texas. Um, and of course, this went through the Spanish as Tejas and to the name of the Confederacy, and that's where we get the word Texas. So just as a kind of a an ironic twist there. That is where the word Texas comes from. In fact, so again, it's not it comes from through Spanish, but it goes back to Caddo culture. Okay, let's also talk about how Texas plays in with the U.S. Um, in its friendliness. In fact, um, Texas is kind of a microcosm of the U.S. Now, if you remember your Mark Twain and talking about steamships on the Mississippi, you may remember there was something referred to as the Texas. And you see a picture here of a 19th century steamship. Um, the top part here is called the Texas. So the crew quarters uh, are there. It's the biggest because it, they're all together in one place. The other cabins are um, named for usually for states. So they called it the Texas because before we had Alaska, Texas was the largest state in area. So it meant that it was a big thing. It's the Texas. Now, if you look at a modern um, paddle boat, and it doesn't work on steam anymore, I don't think, uh, down the Mississippi, um, like the Delta Queen here, you'll see that the text is still called the Texas deck with only the sun deck above it. And in fact, if you look at the uh, cabins you can, you can uh, reserve here, you'll notice the Texas deck um, actually has a Texas lounge um, and the cabin deck here on the, at another area of the ship um, has the front porch of America. It's a registered trademark. So they followed through with this idea from over 150 years earlier of calling the biggest thing Texas. Now, this course plays out in other products too that are usually not called this within Texas, but only outside. Um, I'm not originally from Texas, but when I was growing up, if you got a very thick piece of toast, it was called Texas toast. Here's one made by a New York baker, which is somewhat ironic. Also, the other there were hot sauces, but one that we always had, and it's usually for barbecue or something, is called Texas Pete, which I don't believe you ever see in Texas. Okay, so let's talk about um, how Texas is loud and proud here. Um, uh, well, a lot of our culture, so this affects how we interact with people in, in business situations, is that quantity and size are predominant U.S. and Texan features. We upsize uh, fast food and drinks, um, but we have to keep in mind what, what we're at, um, working within in our culture is that upsizing also means that two-thirds of Americans are overweight and 40% are obese. And those are official medical definitions. Um, so today, Texas means big and proud. It's a microcosm of the U.S. itself. In many ways, America is amazing, but it's also really weird. Here are three wacky things that you'll find about American culture. Number one, things are huge. Highways, cars, stores, food, and even people are really, really large. In America, you can find soda cups as big as your head. That's a huge size, Grandma. Huge! Number two, we love small talk. When you're walking around the streets of the U.S., strangers will greet you by saying, how are you? What's going on? The funny thing is that they're not really asking how you're doing. They're just saying hi. Number three, football is more popular than soccer. While the rest of the world is obsessed with soccer and the World Cup, Americans... So there we go. Now, this is a, a fellow who does um, his videos. He is an American, travels all around the world. So he's got, being out of the country, he's got to reflect on um, how we do things right here in the U.S. Okay, now, um, anybody who's been diving into um, a little bit of AI, especially AI-generated images, um, this is one if you put in Texas, so a larger person with a larger burger and a large gun as well. Um, now, uh, that was a few months ago. This is more recent. Here are AI-generated images 
of Texans. Now, we know that AI generation is not always entirely accurate, but what it does is it takes from thousands or tens of thousands of things said, written, and um, uh, published, you know, and images of, of whatever it is you're looking up. And this is how Texas comes out. I think every single one of these, there's a cowboy hat. There's even a, a steer here. It's men and women. But this is, this means this is how Texas is perceived by the world. Uh, and I can, I can vouch for that. I hosted a, a friend from um, Budapest, Hungary. And when he got here, the very first thing he wanted to do was to buy a cowboy hat. So we went out and got him one. Okay. Now, um, uh, BuzzFeed had an interviewer go out and check with people. Um, I believe he's, he's mostly here in Brussels to ask people um, things about what they think of the U.S. Now, first he asked, does anyone want to try an American accent? Now, the person that responds doesn't say, he didn't say a Texas accent, it's an American accent. And um, for copyright reasons, I'm just going to show you the still photos here. So this English woman actually says, yee-haw, and she follows that up with, so howdy, partner, we're going down to do some shooting. So she's got Texas kind of nailed here in terms of its stereotype, right? The howdiness of being friendly, but also with guns. Now he asked some other people too. Um, one woman who's Belgian said that Americans can be pretty loud. And um, this young man from Poland says they're kind of fat and all that. He didn't really want to say, but it fits a basic European, at least stereotype of an American. Now um, we like to brand things in Texas. Uh, here we have DQ which is not Texan, but we brand it. It's the Texas country, it's DQ, Texas DQ. But I notice even here for last year, and if you know next month with our total eclipse coming up, they even have branded eclipse glasses. It's very Texan. I don't know if any other states doing this. Um, I've asked some people in other states, they've never heard of it, but it is a very Texan thing. I guess technically it is our eclipse, except when it passes and goes up into Illinois and on from there. Okay, so let's talk about some of where how the world sees us goes back a generation or two to the 1950s, 60s spaghetti western. And this is one particular one. So usually they're called that because they're usually made in Italy on low budgets. Uh, people got started that way. Clint Eastwood was in these sort of uh, westerns. But this is how the Old West and therefore modern day Texas is seen. So there you go. Texas is right in the name. Okay. So let's just go a little more. Now, we have to have this underpinning before we talk about more of the actual business protocol aspects, because we have to deal with the idea before you ever walk in a room, this is what people in another country, on another continent often, are going to think of who you are before you. they've even met you, right? One of the most extreme, if you go back about 50 years to the Mary Tyler Moore show, was um, maybe one of the most extreme and brief stereotypes on popular television that maybe you've ever seen, or if you haven't, you'll see right now. All right, okay, I will go see Wild Jack Monroe. Correct, <laughs> yeah, that's see. cleared up. Gordy, how weird is he? He is weird. <laughs> Hey, I got one there. Hey, there's another Mr. one. Mr. Hi, old friend. Uh, Mr. Monroe, uh, listen, I came to see you about Lou Grant. Lou Grant? Well, he said that you personally hired him to be the news director at WJM. Oh, yeah, my station here in town. Well, Mr. Phelps is going to fire him. Oh, Slim Phelps, my new station manager. He's going to fire him, huh? Yes, sir. What's the matter? Is he one of them right eagles? Mr. Grant? Oh, no, I'm always kidding him about being too conservative. Young lady, there ain't no such a thing as being too conservative. <laughs> I, I, you know, I said I was kidding. 
You know, that's one thing. You can't be too careful these days. What with them long-haired hippies are running around with them wild clothes on. Why, I can't. <laughs> oh, I'm okay. I'm a cowboy. I think I need a shot of who get John. So, uh, so they're firing him, huh? How old is this here, uh, uh, Grant Beller? He's 45. Amazing. 45. You know, it's on my 45th birthday that the studio called me in and told me I was through. That's when I found out. You know that building that they fired me in? I owned it. You didn't know that? No, you see, I had this here accountant fella, and unbeknownst to me why he'd been a investing my money for me. You name it, I owned it lock, stock, and barrel, thanks to good old Slim Schwartz. That would be your accountant? Yeah, and I thought I was washed up. And you weren't, and neither is Lou Grant. That's why I came to see you. Well, I make it a point not to butt into the way my business is handled, but let me just kind of twist it around in my mind a while. I'll be a getting back to you, Miss... Uh, Richards. Well, I'll be a seeing you, Slim. Okay. Well, so it seems that even uh, business with a Texan not in Texas still somehow involves uh, cowboy uh, attire, a gun, and even, and even a horse of sorts, right? So this is how the world sees us. All right. Um, so... Let's talk about also, let's narrow it down, though. We've talked about American stereotypes, some Southern and Texan, but even there's distinctions between um, three of our biggest cities here, Dallas, Austin, and Houston. Um, uh, after my friend from Hungary got his cowboy hat, he wanted to go see the uh, South Fork Ranch in Dallas, <laughs> even though it's been years after, you know, many years since, um, you know, the, the uh, TV series was off. He wanted to go see what cattle ranches and oil and business were all about. Of course, Austin were known for entertainment, tech, and fun, and that is certainly playing into our four areas of South by Southwest these two weeks. And of course, Houston's known for oil and the space industry. Um, even, even our accents might be distinguished. If you notice with um, uh, comedian Fred Armisen here, he distinguishes Dallas from Austin from Houston. Texas, I kind of, the, Dallas, Dallas to me seems the most forthright, but then Houston, I feel like they're scolding you a little, Houston, but Austin's got, Austin wants to have fun. I, I, I would like to put a little laugh in Austin, Dallas, Houston, Dallas, Dallas. There you go. So we're the fun of the three. We're not scolding, we're not businesslike, we're in kind of literally and figuratively in the middle of the other two. Okay, so let's get to how this plays into uh, to our business protocol here. Um, one of the things we first start with, of course, is greetings. How when we first encounter someone, and that a big, that's a big deal because you can't really make more than one first impression, of course. So we tend to be very informal and that's a way that we show, again, that everyone is equal. We don't have power dif uh, dif uh, distances. Um, you always shake hands in business settings. And in small groups, you shake hands when meeting someone for the first time. So if it's a group, the group, there's going to be a lot of handshaking. That's going to be a good 10 minutes right there. Um, now, it was the idea during the pandemic, this might dissipate. We find other ways, but the handshake is back and it's probably here to stay. Um, you shake hands firmly for two or three times, you maintain eye contact uh, because in other cultures, say in Japan, you would not because it's deference to lower your eyes. But in the U.S., it's seen as, sign as a, weak, a sign of weakness. So um, if you offer your hand first, it presents both confidence and friendliness. And um, there really is no difference in level of your position that simply putting your hand out first means I want to meet you. Um, if it's a very large and informal group, you can raise your hand up and say, hello, kind of wave to everyone, and that takes care of the entire group. Now, one of the things 
Um, we like our handshake so much. I want you to notice here, here's a teacher greeting each of his students with different sorts of quite involved handshakes, which is a distinctly American thing. There we go. So see what we have going on here. There is this um, leveling of power here, even with teacher and young students. Um, by doing this, he's saying, I'm at your level. And by doing it with him, they're up to his level. So there is, again, this evening without power distance in authority, um, but also this friendliness in a certain touch. So we can have a formal handshake, but the extreme form is a very American thing. Um, now, let's make sure we get our formal handshakes correct. Now, this seems a bit odd. Why focus on handshake? But it's the very first contact you have with someone you're greeting and you want to get it right. And this varies, of course, according to country. I know when I lived in, uh, I lived in Belgium and there, like in France, they do the kind of cheek kiss thing and you have to get it right. In some places, it's two and some it's three and some it's four kisses. So it is good that we learn uh, for someone visiting here, that they learn to get the handshake correct. Hi, I'm Laura Caton from Caton Consulting, and today we'll be talking about tips for a proper handshake. Has anybody ever given you the slippery wet fish? How about the nurse handshake where they're taking your pulse? How about the over-enthusiastic UFC handshake? How about the finger handshake, where they just shake your fingers? So let's talk about the elements of a proper handshake. Your web must connect to somebody else's web to give a complete handshake. Then curl your fingers around. Squeeze. The two words you want to remember are firm and brief. And, and then pump two or three times. So what are the main elements to remember about giving a proper handshake? First, your web must connect to somebody else's web to give a complete handshake. Two, curl your fingers around and then squeeze. Pump two or three times. The words you want to remember are firm and brief. Then introduce yourself and let go. So what does your handshake say about you? Thanks for tuning in. And check out more of our videos to help you enhance your chance for success. So as we see here, it seems like such a technicality, but people will remember if you give them the you know, various words for it, like limp fish handshake. Some of the ones you showed here, they were too aggressive or not assertive enough. And you want that sweet little spot because that's what the very first meeting you have with an American um, and you wanna make sure you get it right. Okay, now the second part here is the Southern or Texas uh, informality of touch that may be um, a little odd or off-putting for people from other cultures um, that we even have something called a neck hug. Uh, if you see your family, there's gonna be a 20 minutes of everybody hugging everybody. Um, they'll even say, I'm gonna hug your neck. Um, it could be after a long absence, like a family reunion or a, at a holiday. And uh, and if you're not sure, you can let the other person um, initiate it. This is the great thing about culture. You don't have to go first. There is no order here as it is in some other cultures. So if you're meeting an American, 
or you are an American meeting someone from another culture, either person can initiate it. Um, uh, you'll notice that in some of these, you want to extend the arms at the 10 and two positions on the clock. A full body hug is reserved for somebody you know more informally, but a neck hug is just for a few seconds. So it could be somebody that you've gotten to know well in a business setting. You see them again after a year, and instead of the regular handshake, it is a hug. It's pretty normal um, if you're a Southerner or, or um, a Texan. So let's just take a quick look here at some of those differences. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the different types of hugs. This right here is the friend zone hug. If she hits you with the side hug, you're in the friend zone. This right here is the family hug or the I haven't seen you in a long time. Hands go on opposite sides and then a little shake afterwards. Real fake smiles. So there you go. Right. It is not an intimate thing. It is simply a touch thing, which is very Southern. And I do say that it is definitely Southern because um, Midwest, somewhat less common, definitely in the Northeast, uncommon. Uh, it is something that, that uh, for example, a New Englander or a New Yorker will comment on about a Southern in the hug. Why give it a hug? And again, it's simply a matter of distinction. If I'm up there, I wouldn't do it. And if they're down here, I would do it, right? So it's a matter of where you are. But there are types of hugs, just as there's types of handshakes. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about greetings too and, and how are you? Um, you again, you first, you shake hands, you smile and you maintain eye contact while you do that. And you say, how do you do? Now, often um, people confuse, especially if they don't speak English, the difference between how are you with how do you do? But you only say, how do you do one time when you meet somebody, only the first time you meet them. And it doesn't have an answer. It's not really even a question because the answer to how do you do is how do you do? It's the one time when you first meet. If you do it again and say, how do you do? It might even be seen as an insult because you might want to say, actually, we met last year. Maybe they didn't remember. Of course, you don't bring that up. Um, if someone says, um, as we can see here, if someone says, um, how are you? Which is different than how do you do? You say, fine, thank you. How are you? You respond, you thank, and you ask the same. You don't actually go into personal details. That is considered too intimate. If somebody starts talking about a problem, that is really out of bounds. And likewise, if you do it right, there is a line we're friendly, but you're not a friend here. Um, of course, we also have the WhatsApp mod. It's a backwards nod. Uh, Europeans often use this as well. Um, generally, men use it more than women. Um, but this is saying, I know you're there. It's called phatic communication, P-H-A-T-I-C. This is better than no communication. You see somebody in the hall that you know, you're busy, you don't want to talk. You do a backwards nod. It said, it means I see you there. How you doing? But I can't talk right now. Uh, you're meeting new people. You see somebody you already know. Just do a, you can do a backwards head nod saying, hey, I see you there because we've met. Okay. Um, now, some of these things are about how you use the word you. Uh, Different parts of the country pluralize you different. There's in the north, you have you skies, that sort of thing. Um, but we have, particularly in the south and in Texas, we have y'all, which is short for you all. So you say, hey, y'all. Uh, this distinguishes because the singular and plural you are the same in English. So one person may be you, and more than one, two or five or ten is y'all. Um, if it's a really big group, just to make sure that everyone knows they're included, you might double it up and say, all y'all. Like, you're all invited to my house for a barbecue. But instead of saying you or you all or y'all, you say all y'all. Now, you can mix up hi and hey in there with howdy. Uh, howdy, I don't think you're really going to hear outside of Texas, but hey is a very Southern thing. Uh, so you get howdy y'all, hey y'all, hi y'all. Now, I want you to notice, you see the image on the left here. I saw this at our local Ikea. The Swedish company actually Texanized this a little bit for Austin and put howdy y'all. Okay, now in greetings, we tend to be very um, informal. Um, if you had no two people and you want to introduce the two of them, they don't know each other, you name one and you name the other by pointing it out. So you look at Tom and say, Tom Jones, this is Mary Matthews. Then they're free to shake hands 
two to three times pumped, look at each other in the eye and uh, can say hello to each other. How do you do? And maybe how are you? Um, if the host for some reason doesn't introduce you, which is uh, pretty informal at that point, you can introduce yourself. You go in case someone's like, well, well, okay, how are you? Hi, I'm Fred Lopez, Director of Operations. So not only do they have a name, but they know why you're there and what you do. That's sort of your title. Um, uh, so you want to go beyond the professional title, as you see here on the left. Say what your contribution is, like Director of Operations. Um, and you could uh, try to be funny with it, but as you're first meeting someone, the first step matters the most. So you want to stick with these traditional ways. Now, you notice with Tom Jones and Mary Matthews, there are no titles here either. And there's not even necessarily a position named. Um, but if someone has a doctorate, for example, it might be uh, Dr. Tom Jones. This is Mary Matthews. It might seem odd. Why would you say to the person that's named Tom, Dr. Tom Jones, you're really letting Mary know his name and you're letting Tom know Mary's name. Okay, um, so we tend to be pretty informal. Uh, so here we go. We have the doctor near. Hi, John. I'd like you to meet Dr. Sarah Lang. Um, we, the only titles we use are Mr., Ms., and Dr. Um, Miss and Mrs. are kind of out of step today. Very informally, somebody might say to a young woman, um, excuse me, Miss, instead of excuse me, ma'am. But as a title, these are the only three titles. Um, uh, sometimes there's positional titles, but only within the company. This is Director Sang, but he's not director outside of that. Uh, General John Smith, not really general outside of the army, let's say, Mr. Smith, unless as, as a courtesy, you would still use the title general. Um, uh, now, at that point, instead of a title and last name, if somebody wants to, they can say, please call me Sarah. So that way, somebody doesn't know whether to call them Dr. Lang or Sarah. She can put them at ease and say, just call me Sarah. It reduces the, it starts a little formal, first steps, but moves to the informal. Okay, now in terms of spacing, um, Americans um, do tend to be a little more Northern European, as you might say. The further North you go in Europe, the further people stand apart. You can try it, go into an elevator. If you stand too close in Scandinavia, someone will get off on the next floor. Now in Italy, not true, or Greece, Mediterranean Europe, um, but we tend to, we do tend to keep our distance uh, after we've sh uh, shaken hands or if somebody you know, there's the quick hug, you'll notice even in video, then you stand apart. So you're about two to five feet away. You avoid PDA or personal displays of affection um, and um, touching, putting arms over shoulders, deep hugging, of course, kissing are only friends and family and you wanna keep your distance. It's always better to err on the side of formality. That's always the rule of thumb. Someone may see you as a little stiff if you do that, but better than being seen to be too handsy, for example. Uh, you wanna make eye contact, but look away now and then and never stare. One big difference, for example, in Romance Europe, where Romance languages are spoken, people tend to maintain eye contact longer. And if you learn that habit as I did and come back to the US, <laughs> doesn't work well. Um, occasional eye contact, but not too long. Okay, so let's talk about attire. Uh, there is kind of a standard business attire in the Western world, um, and we too tend to do this. We dress more formally in business settings, informally in social settings. Um, if you're not sure, err on the side of the more formal. So men wear dark suits, colorful neckties, and socks. Suits should be charcoal gray or navy. You never want a fully black suit. That's for morticians. Um, uh, but now, as the picture shows here, some businesses allow open shirts with pocket squares instead of ties. Now, I think in the pandemic, this has become more of a trend because the necktie can seem very constraining. But the pocket square allows a little touch of color, probably a little touch of silk. It can be uh, folded over in different ways in the pocket. It also provides a little asymmetry because ties are hard to get perfectly straight and be symmetrical. Um, this may be root. Now, this is extremely formal here. This may be a Texan who's wearing denim, but still wear a jacket with a pocket square. But even with a nice blazer and shirt, um, often the pocket square is the root. 
especially in a hot place like Texas. So we'll see where this goes. Um, it does seem to be kind of moving into that direction. And of course, women can wear dark dresses or white or colorful blouses with dark skirts, but should avoid low cut blouses, short skirts and noisy jewelry. So always keep in mind, you're not going out on the town. You're going out to meet your business associates. Okay, um, so uh, we, we tend to dress more formally in business settings. If it's at a restaurant or the host house, you're probably gonna be a lot more informal unless it's say a business lunch, because it's as if you're coming from the work from your office to meet for an hour and then going back. So you're probably dressed up a little more. You can wear slacks or khaki pants, what we call business casual. Um, even sometimes drenched dark jeans may be okay if they're very dark and there's no holes or fading and that sort of thing. And they, they fit well. Oh yeah. Oh, and this could be for a uh, backyard barbecue. If you're lucky enough to get invited, um, you definitely want to dress down. You're going to be outside. There's, it's hot, there's food and there's grass and you don't want anything to get messed up. Okay. Now, of course, in Texas, there may be jeans and boots involved as part of an emblem of pride in their Lone Star heritage. But see what others are going to wear. I went to an event last year. I got to tell you, I didn't have any cowboy boots and I had to go buy some. And they're some of the most comfortable shoes I've ever had. <laughs> they're really nice. But everyone there wore boots. And in fact, part of the event, um, everyone, they had a, a service there. Everyone had a cowboy hat made for them um, in the moment, uh, which was which is nice. A nice little extra feature there. Um, so... Uh, of course, the jeans go over the boots, which people outside of Texas often don't know. If you've seen Kermit the Frog, uh, he always wears the jeans within the boots, and that sort of stereotype. Um, you can also wear cowboy hats. Now, you, you can have boots without hats, but you can't have hats without boots. It's the last step. It's the topper on the cake, as it were. Uh, you wear a cooler straw, straw hat in warmer months. Um, and only the heavier ones, the felt hats in uh, cooler months. Okay, so here's an example. What could be more of an example than, again, the show Dallas? Here's the Ewing Ranch, uh, a sort of more formal event. And this is what the world sees. And you may think Texans look this way. God, I told you he'd show. Now what are we gonna do? We get rid of him real fast. Come on. Mama, Digger. Digger. It's all right, Pam. I've already told him he's welcome. So he's gonna come, Miss Ellie, and he knows that. You may see the contrast here. Uh, oops. You may notice here we have one person wearing a shirt, tie, and a jacket, and someone else wearing all the way to wearing um, the full regalia of the cowboy, including chaps. It can be very mixed this way. The point is it's the same level of formality, but just expressed in sort of a national way versus a Texan way. Okay, now when you meet someone, do you bring gifts? In business settings, no, but if you visit someone's home, of course, you want to bring a small gift, something that's uh, useful in that moment, like flowers, wine, chocolate. You could even bring a book, Maybe it represents your culture. And the gift is open upon arrival. In some cultures, you don't open it because it could be embarrassing, but you ought to immediately open it. Um, it could be something that represents your culture. Um, now, the wine may or may not be used. Maybe they have wine ready to go, and that's perfectly appropriate. They'll put the wine on their counter in their wine rack, but may use it later, and that's just fine. Uh, by the way, one question comes up. You don't know if someone has a problem with alcohol, or whether they drink alcohol, but remember the gift is not really for them, it's for them to share with their guests. So wine is always appropriate. And of course you wanna avoid personal or expensive gifts, which also may be a sort of a conflict of not only of interest, but um, maybe a little uncomfortable in a business setting. Now, punctuality um, is, oops, well, pardon me. 
went ahead there a little bit. There we go. Let me go back just a second here. Uh, meetings are usually informal, but the content is serious. So you want to be a little early and you never know, especially for an Austin traffic can be an issue. It's better to arrive early and to relax, then show up, prepare in advance, have your facts and figures ready to go. Note that only written contracts are legally binding, oral contracts are not as the final word. They may be the beginning, but it still needs to be something signed. Um, keep in mind, you want to always be early because it's hot here often. You don't want anybody confusing flop sweat with heat sweat. So it's better to, to arrive early, walk around, have a seat, cool off. Try to be there early. Arriving late can be seen as passive aggressive power struggle attempt. Okay, business cards. Now this is a big iffy thing. You'll notice the cards here are not very nicely printed. They also have a QR code. In some cases, it's only QR codes. It's only electronic. Um, but the thing is, people still rely on physical items, and it's probably a good idea to carry um, your business, business cards around in a case and to share them with somebody um, at the beginning of a meeting or at the end after you've talked to everyone. The QR code's good because only some information is on there, and they can put you into their phone that way. Um, language, here's a very technical sort of uh, chart here. Um, we prefer to be as direct as possible. If you're circuitous, if you do something circularly, it's considered uh, a means of, of uh, <laughs> it, it means that you are trying to be deceptive. It may be seen as deceptive. Now, circular ways of talking are seen as polite in other cultures, but not in American culture, regardless of whether it's in the U.S., it's, it's a whole, the South, um, Texas, or Austin. Um, uh, Yes means yes, no means no. Maybe really does mean with further thought it's possible. Now in Japan, for example, maybe is a polite way of saying no, but in the US, maybe should be maybe. Like, you know, maybe let's talk about it more later. Um, you also wanna ask questions for clarification. If you don't ask anything, it's assumed everything's understood. It might also be assumed that you weren't really listening. Follow-up questions mean, I heard what you said, but let's refine it. Um, also, you want to speak often and freely because silence makes Americans uncomfortable. And that's certainly true. Okay, so let's talk about, we've just got a little bit left here, ladies and gentlemen, for question and answer, if you like. Um, let's talk about uh, dining. So we've talked about meeting, greeting and meeting and now dining. Business entertaining is usually over lunch or dinner in a restaurant. Whoever invite does the invitation is the one who pays. Um, Home entertaining is also a nice thing. It's a nice, very nice treat to find out more about not only your host, but about the culture at large by being in their household. Um, a backyard, bar backyard barbecue is always a nice treat. That's something you're likely to be invited to. Show up um, after, unlike a business meeting where you show up early, you never show up <laughs> at, at an event at the time listed. Um, if it says 6 to 8 p.m., you can show up at 6.15, but no earlier because you're allowing the host to still set up. You never want to be the first person there, and you never want to be the last one to leave. Now, if you're getting to a half hour late, maybe um, dinner has already started being served and it's a bit uncomfortable. I wouldn't do that. If you really can't show, um, uh, then you need to let them know. Um, usually, there's still some formalities in dining. The guest of honor is usually seated at the head of the table or to the right of the host. That gives them a special position there, saying welcome. And of course, you wait for the host to eat before you do. Um, uh, that's still kind of an issue in restaurants, even when there's not a host. If you're out with a friend and your their dish comes and no, your dish comes and theirs doesn't, still today, often someone will wait till theirs comes, even if yours is getting cold, because it feels uncomfortable and is seen as rude if you eat before someone else does. Um, if you have dietary restrictions, you can just say, no, thank you. Um, and of course, unlike in some cultures, you don't want to make sounds when you're eating. You should make no sound at all. Um, you can have drinks, but two drinks, never more than two. Um, leave before the stated time on the invitation. So if it's six to eight, you can leave at 730 and that's just fine. You always want to leave um, having them wanting more of you, not less of you. Uh, at the restaurant, if you host and pay, remember to tip 15 to 20%. It's usually automatic with eight or more people, sometimes six or more. 
And um, um, if someone's hosted you and they were there long enough, you can host them, but go with understatement. It's not a competition. It's simply a way, a means to meet your partners. Okay, let's talk a little bit about table manners. We just have a little bit more here. Um, table manners are pretty informal, but the main thing has to do with um, uh, uh, the way you use your hands. And you'll notice here, uh, in cultures, all cultures, it seems to matter where your, your hands and arms go according to the table. But of course, children are always told, no elbows on the table. So your forearm can be on the table with your hands above, but the elbows stay back and are never on the table. That looks like leaning or hanging out and it's, it's, it's considered vulgar. Now, one of the differences is compared to even the British is we tend to use the left hand for the fork, the right hand for a knife. And when we're done cutting our food, we put the knife down and we use our right hand with the fork. Whereas in Britain, for example, they leave it in their left hand. Um, people will notice this. So remember, if you're not, never sure, always watch what other people are doing. And there might even be entertained that you're kind of watching them to make sure you get it right. You always leave a little bit of food on the plate when you're finished eating, because otherwise, like in other cultures, it means I ate everything because I was really hungry and you didn't give me enough. So you always leave a little something. And you'll notice here you leave the, your utensils in a parallel position. Some people turn the fork upside down so it doesn't automatically get hit and flip off the plate. So um, let's just take a quick look at how you use your utensils. I know, seems like a very small thing, but people notice these small things just like with the handshake. So what's the American style? At the core, it means that you eat the majority of your food with your dominant hand and your fork only. While you eat with your dominant hand, your other hand rests on your lap or underneath the table. So what does the American style look like? Basically, you hold the fork in your dominant hand and you only move it to the non-dominant hand when you cut. So let's say you have a steak, your fork moves to the non-dominant hand, you cut, you put the knife down, you switch hands and you eat the piece of meat. If you want to cut another piece, you repeat the procedure again. There we go. So it's just doing it once and then repeat. Uh, if you don't do it that way, it does seem a bit odd. Um, if you do it and someone will even maybe think you're British or have lived in Britain, um, if you use it mostly the same way, keep the fork in the left hand. So again, it's just a matter of the difference of cultures. Not one is better than the other. It's just simply the way we do things. Um, so we can talk about it in a very Southern way. The Andy Griffith show from the 60s was about North Carolina, so it's about the South. But we're very, we're very sensitive about faux pas when it comes to things that we take as pretty essential as politeness in manners and etiquette in eating. So I want you to notice here of this, of Ernest T. Bass here, who is this mountain man, which means in this town, that means he is less evolved. That's how they see the mountains in Western North Carolina. And I want you to notice how he learns better manners. It's impossible. Look at him. <laughs> He's a challenge. He's a mess. <laughs> Not that. Mm -hmm. right. That's it. Hey, you. Mr. Bass, mm -hmm. will you pass the bread, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Throwing food is a sin. It certainly is. You pass it, you don't throw it. I just don't cotton all this. <laughs> Too daggone many rules. I don't like it. I don't like it. Now, Ernest T., we're just trying to help you fit into society. Now, you want a girl or don't you? Would you pass the potatoes, please? <laughs> yeah. Well, what's the matter? I passed it. I didn't hear that. <laughs> don't pass one, you pass the whole thing. Oh, thank you. Whole thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, of course, it's funny because 
you don't handle the food that you give to someone else. It's always on a plate. Even if it's something small, you hand them the plate with it on it for them to take it. So it's funny here because Americans tend to take it for granted. But if you're coming to America, and especially if you're coming to the South or Texas or Austin, you want to make sure that you do get that right. But all you have to do is watch what other people do. Go for formality. Uh, there could be some item that could be passed individually. I mean, salt and pepper shaker could be passed. Of course, they're not on a plate. But make sure the food is still on its original serving platter. Okay, now let's talk about conversation and faux pas when you're at the table. Now, this is comedian uh, Conan O'Brien learning how to uh, dine with a Southern etiquette uh, expert. Of course, he makes it funny, but I want you to notice here how uh, the fellow he's sitting with is trying to engage in casual conversation at the table. So you notice it's not business conversation, but it is what connects them. Tell me how long you've been a student of Perfectly Polished. I have been polished. with Perfectly Polished for seven years. Okay, and, and what was your crime? <laughs> I'm noticing that Adam is very well dressed. If you don't mind, I would like to up my game. Certainly. Bruce, do you mind? Now it is you who is underdressed. <laughs> I'll ask you to leave my home. Get out. Adam, ask him a question. Ask him a leading question to try to get to what he enjoys talking about. Mr. O'Brien, what is your favorite type of music? Um, oh, I just listen to whatever's on the radio. I don't care about music. What type of station do you listen to? I don't know. I just push buttons till I hear something that kind of sounds familiar. I don't care. Do you like to travel? I don't really like to go outside much. I like to stay in my house where I'm most comfortable. Well, what do you like to do at your house? I like to just sit in the center of my room and do as little as possible. So you like to sleep? I don't sleep that much. I can't sleep. I get these bad dreams. So you swap... How did that go? Not really great. I was honest. I would call you close to being charm-free because you didn't match his level of enthusiasm for conversation. Aha. Uh -huh. So, of course, it is a joke. But what we see here is you ask sort of anodyne, just sort of basic questions. Uh, what sort of music do you like to listen to? And it opens it up. It's very open-ended, right? And so not only did Conan kind of uh, push it off, but he, you notice he didn't ask any questions in return. So that's certainly important in interpersonal communication. But even in the informal um, environment of people you don't may not know well, it's normal to ask those sort of questions. You'll notice... Um, of course, the three topics off the table are always the same three, no politics, no religion, and no sex, um, but simple things about music or culture and that sort of thing, right? Um, it could even be, of course, the obvious one is the weather, and people are endlessly, I mean, Texans are endlessly amused at someone coming in who didn't realize that August maybe was not the best month and that it is quite hot and could be, could be even humid. Um, so he failed on two regards. Not only did he not really kind of honestly answer the question, but he also didn't ask any questions in return. And at some point, someone will cut that off and it doesn't bode well for a good partnership. Okay, one last thing here um, for the U.S. Um, in refining. We've done uh, greeting, meeting, dining, and now refining. There's not a lot to say here um, about um, women in business because of our lack of uh, differences in, um, you know, being individuals and lack of, of levels of authority. Uh, women are in all areas of, uh, of business in American life, and you will never assume that a woman is in a subordinate position. Um, likewise, foreign women will not have much difficulty conducting business in the U.S. Um, um, it is maybe a little inappropriate if a woman asks a man to dinner, um, uh, because it may be misconstrued as a date, but lunch is always fine because it's the same you're coming from work and you're going right back. In fact, you're still dressed that way, right? It's an hour. Everyone is checking their watches. You have a nice lunch to talk about things. It's daylight and then you leave and that's just fine. Okay, now one last thing I want to just cover here. Uh, we can't really do this much in a presentation without getting more involved, like in a workshop, but you can actually check your own cultural dimensions. We mentioned Gerda Hofstede and these six cultural dimensions. Now, like this site, I, IDR Labs, you can actually go here, answer a few questions, and it will, um, here's a question, for example, something about saving money. 
and it will calculate your results and will note which country you are most like. Now, I actually use this in classes, and I find that students um, 100% of the time never actually match the American dimensions. I mean, I'm not sure what that says, but a lot of the same countries are listed. So I did this. Mine is closest to Norway. So it gives me things here. I like low power distance, but that's like the US, et cetera. So this is the way you can find out, even if you're from a particular country, maybe your cultural dimensions vary as an individual. So you can take a test like this to see how you match up, as you can see here, with the United States. Um, the US, you'll notice under masculinity is very high. Norway ranks extremely low. In other words, more a social uh, healthcare system and that sort of thing. Maybe that comes from living in Belgium, living in Western Europe and having being part of their um, social healthcare system. Some of the things I'm certainly able to answer about the same. Um, a lot of these are a little different. Norway has even lower power distance, even lower. So this lets you know where you, how you might interact with people from that culture. I mean, from the culture that you are being programmed, you know, what, that the program says that you are versus the US. Um, let's see, now we only have, we're about, about to enter, enter question and answer here, um, but I just wanted to show you a little bit of, a um, little bit more of stereotypes. Hold on just Horseback riding, oil drilling, boot wearing, proud people. Just a couple of the stereotypes that continue to stick about Texas. And this is after Dallas premiered nearly 40 years ago right here on CBS. Jennifer Lindgren shows us how the long running primetime drama is shaping opinions of te Texas to this very day. It's today's biggest moment in DFW history. If people outside the Lone Star State... I thought you would find oil fields all over the place. Imagine a certain stereotypes when Texas comes to mind. The proper cowboy hat, so yeah, 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 had to be done. It's possible they can trace that impression back to April 2nd, 1978. When Dallas made its TV debut on CBS. It just has a lot of warm uh, and fuzzy memories for people. And when they hear the theme song. Sally Peavy is the mansion manager at the famed Ewing Estate out in Parker, Texas, where production crews film the exterior scenes of the show for 14 seasons. It's a job. They pay me to do this. Just call her Sally South Fork. She is an encyclopedia of Dallas knowledge, the juicy storylines, glamorous characters, and the drama that captivated the world. Who shot JR? Everybody around the world wanted to know who shot JR. So there we go. And people still go to Dallas to see the South Fork Ranch, hoping that it's still the stereotype that they had watched. Uh, now, just a couple more things. Even Starbucks sells our stereotypes. Here's one for Texas, a mug for Texas. Here is one for Austin itself. It's always very amusing if you live in Austin yourself to look to see what you think counts as to see if you can recognize everything. Like, wait, what is that? How is that Texas or Austin? Uh, there are lots of videos that welcome us. And in the interest of time, though, I'm just going to show you one that's very Sure. Here is a one minute version to come see us. Y'all, let's take a look. Texas is blowing up these days, and one city in particular seems to be capturing most of the national attention. That's right, we're off to Austin. Welcome to another episode of 60 Second Cities, the quick video series that takes you around the world in less than a minute. Austin is the capital of Texas and the southernmost state capital in the United States. It's situated on the Colorado River, not to be confused with the other larger Colorado River. Austin has 964,000 people within the city and 2.3 million people in the metropolitan area, making it the 28th largest metro region in the US. Today, Austin has made a unique name for itself as a hip urban city with claims to famous events such as South by Southwest and a vibrant food scene led by Texas barbecue and Tex-Mex cuisine. For sports, Austin has just a single major league team in Austin FC of Major League Soccer, but is also dominated by the Texas Longhorns of college football. A new 60 Second City premieres every Thursday right here on Geography by Jeff. Next 
And that concludes uh, our, uh, our meeting here today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me here. And if you have any questions, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I realize this one is quite a variety because you're either from here, you might think that plays out Americans or Texans or Austinites the right way or not. But also if you're not from here, hopefully it's a good intro to where we are right here in Austin. Aditi, do we have any questions out there? Oh, I see in the chat line. Dr. Oh, well, thank you, Julie. Have questions. Oh, yeah. do you see a question? Oh, um, oh, it was a direct question. Uh, oh, oh well, Julie, thank you. She's thanking me for the presentation. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Does anyone have any questions before we wrap up our session for 2024? We have a few <laughs> minutes for Dr. Clark to answer any questions. Uh, By the way, I, just, I just wanted to thank Dr. Clark. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Oh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, uh, also, feel free if you got, you know, that's not really Texas or Austin, let me know. And again, I've lived here for a while, but I'm not from here. So I kind of get both, I'm kind of on both sides of that. That's true. But that was a very good session, Dr. Clark. I mean, it was in depth and, you know, it gave us an idea of Austin from, especially for someone who would be new. When I came to the city, I wish I'd had this opportunity to, to attend a training like this, because it would have taught me a lot that but that has not actually taken a few years to learn. Uh, Janet has raised a hand and she has a question. Yes, hi, please. Um, hi, yeah, this is Janan. Um, I just wanted to put a little bit of my experience. I've been living in Austin for some time as a um, German by nationality. Um, I just wanted to notice, I just noticed um, that the small talk topics sports are very um, high up. And I was very, un I had no knowledge about sports period. So maybe for newcomers that are coming, study the football teams a little bit. Maybe who is doing the Super Bowl. I i don't know anything about it, but it's for sure a topic that is a small talk topic. Um, so oh, that would yeah. be maybe a, a small tip, like study this a little bit. And then I also noticed, at least as a German national, that um, you as Americans or Texans, they really love to talk about the heritage too. So this is a great topic as well to speak about their grandparents that immigrated from England, Ireland, or other European countries or non-European countries. But this is also a great small talk topic to talk about their relation to your country through their heritage. That's a really good idea. Uh, well, you know, one of the biggest uh, gifts in the last few years for people at at, for holidays, birthdays, is Ancestry.com and 23andMe. Um, Americans love finding out about their heritage and the sense of, well, their genetic heritage, because often they don't know. And I've got to admit, I've, I've done three of those tests, you know, and I, there's stuff I didn't know. I didn't know I was one quarter Scandinavian, you know, for example. Um, uh, yeah, that's a very good point, because we our pride is in all the things I've shown here is about being American or Southern or, or, or Texan or an Austinite, but we love finding out more about our background heritage. And as you saw, if you're German, you know, you know that's our largest ethnicity. So uh, people are probably finding out about it all every day. I didn't know they were German. The sports thing's interesting too, because Tex we have that weird mix here. In a lot of the South, for example, college sports rule, not professional sports. Uh, but in Texas, uh, it, it, it's also college, it's mostly UT, right? With just a bit thrown in for soccer. And by the way, yes, um, I, this has been a problem too. Uh, people who come here will need to say football, meaning American football, and it does not mean soccer. Um, this, I think people talk and they're, they're in different camps. All, they're like, wait, what are you talking about? What, the World Cup? That's soccer, that's not football. Like, yep, 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 okay. So we have to be careful about those false friends, you know, the words that are almost the same but are a little different in the different languages. But I appreciate the feedback. Um, yeah, sports is always good if people want to find out if you buy an item of clothing, let's say, that has a longhorn on it, people will comment on it and you're going to be going, um, is that good? Because I've done that in other countries. I bought soccer gear just to see what people would say with the logo. And the problem is it can go the other way too. Like, why would you wear that? I'm like, I don't know. I just like the emblem. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, 
That's the final call for questions. Notions of think... Texas, the South. Oh, I should point out, some Texans are surprised to find that they're in the South. Um, I think Texas is kind of like India because it's technically part of Asia, but it's a subcontinent. And I think Texas is a subcontinent of the South. Uh, Atlanta is the capital of the South, but Austin's the capital of Texas. True, true. I think, Dr. Clark, we are good to go. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, but thank you so much for your session today. This session, is, as it has been live on Facebook, it is also saved on Facebook. You can visit us today and people who, who go to Facebook at any time can go back and watch this training. It will also be posted on YouTube shortly. Thank you for joining us today and we will see you at our next session in May that is on uh, doing business with Asia. I hope you're able to register for that session and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and have a good day.